Hello, this is Susan. Welcome back again. And uh, I think for most people, I already said hello and explained that you can use that chat area over to the left to give each other greetings, and also to ask questions as we go about the day. But right now, I want to turn this over to Jenny Arena and let her welcome you and get this started. Thank you, Susan. Hi, guys. It looks like we have about 128 people logged into this webinar, so thank you so much for joining us. I'm, as Susan said, Jenny Arena with Heritage Preservation. I'm going to give just a quick introduction to the community and these webinars, and then we'll move on to our topic. So Heritage Preservation is moderating the Connecting to Collections online community in cooperation with the American Association for State and Local History and with funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. The site is designed and produced by Learning Time. The goal of the online community is to help smaller museums, libraries, archives, and historical societies quickly locate reliable preservation resources and network with their colleagues. At least once a month, the online community hosts a webinar related to a particularly helpful resource or topic. A recording of today's webinar, along with all of our webinars, can be found here under Meeting Room. And then if you click on Online Event Recordings, you'll see an archive of all of our webinars. We also have our resources and webinars filed by topic under the Topics menu. So if there's something you're particularly interested in, such as paper, you can find that those resources there. So today, I am so pleased to welcome back Tara Kennedy. And as we said, Tara is snowed in, and she's calling us from home. So just bear with us on the sound. Um, but hopefully, everything will go smoothly. So in January, Tara served as an instructor for our online course, Collections Care Basics. And she presented a webinar on mold, which we know is important to everyone and was particularly popular. Um, and so we're bringing that to these regular live chat webinars. Uh, today's webinar is a little different. Um, it'll be 90 minutes instead of our regular hour. Um, Tara, thank you so much for joining us today. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thanks, Jenny. Um, as uh, Jenny said, um, and I think I mentioned earlier, um, I'm the Preservation Field Services Librarian at Yale University Library, which is closed today due to lots and lots of snow. Um, I have experience working in libraries, archives, museums, um, historical collections for over a decade. Um, and I, besides my work at Yale, I also do preservation consulting at uh, cultural institutions around the country. So I'm pleased to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me back. Thank you. So we're going to, before we pull over your presentation, Tara, we are just going to ask one question of our audience. And it's really simple. What brings you here today? And let me expand this for you guys. So what brings you here today? You suspect your organization may have mold issues. You want to be prepared and more informed about the topic. You've dealt with mold issues in the past or another reason. And like our poll questions in the past on our live chat events, uh, this will be a door prize question. So we'll choose a few names at random. And you will win. A fantastic resource from the CDC bookshelf. I do have to say, though, you need to be a member so that we have an email so we can contact you. So it looks like most people, 82 folks, say they just want to be more prepared and more informed about this topic. So I'm going to pull this off. Great. Thanks, Jenny. Throughout the presentation, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into that Q&A box. And we'll try to get to them during breaks and at the end. It's all yours, Tara. Okay, great. See if I can, there it goes. I'm going to slide that over a bit so I can see the screen. Great. So actually, the official title for the, today's lecture is Eek, Mold, Help, <laughs> because I imagine that is sort of how most people feel when they find that there's mold in their collection. So um, 
the next slide should progress. There it goes. Oops, I went too far ahead. So um, the first slide here will sort of show what I'm planning to talk about today in terms of an outline. So first I'm going to talk about what mold is, um, what the contributing factors are um, in terms of getting mold to grow and progress and spread, how you can prevent mold in your collection, some of the health hazards associated with mold, and how you should respond to a mold outbreak, and finally, the recovery steps that are necessary to excuse me, take care of a mold problem in your collection. So to start, what is mold? So the first thing I want to point out is mold that is everywhere, and we can't get rid of it. The only thing we can do is discourage its growth and reproduction by making its environment inhospitable. That is, keeping things clean and dry. So surface molds is what are what we're primarily concerned with. Um, and what they do is they spread something called conidia. Um, and uh, surface molds are a specific class of mold. And um, they reproduce by reproduce by producing conidia, which are spore carriers. And you can see one that looks like a bit of broccoli there on your right. Uh, the spore carriers release spores into the air and let them float away so that they can reproduce elsewhere. It's similar to acorns in an oak tree or pollen from other types of plants. So we have a couple listed here. Um, we have aspergillus. That's one of the most common species of surface mold, and that's the picture you see on your right. Penicillium, um, which, as the name suggests, is penic where penicillin comes from. It's also um, found in blue cheese and other types of cheese. And Sacchibotrys, that's the scary, toxic black mold that you often hear about in the media. So all of those are classified as surface molds. So what you need to keep in mind is that canidia and spores are specifically designed for survival. They will only grow where they have a chance for survival, meaning that they have the correct food and the correct environment. Spores and canidia have thick cell walls, if you remember your biology, um, that have to be penetrated in order to fully kill them. So a little bit about the spore life cycle. There's maturation uh, and release, dormancy, activation, germination, IC, canidium formation, and the cycle continues. So I will show a pictorial version of the life of a spore. So I talked about the canidia. That's um, where the spores come from, and that's what you're seeing there. Um, where the red, if you follow the red arrow, it will take you through the mole life cycle. So the canidia are releasing spores into the air. And there's a lovely little spore. Um, you can see it's one tough customer. With all, it kind of looks like the head of a mace. <laughs> so it's tough to kill. But that's why it's pretty much ubiquitous, and you see it everywhere, and it's hard to get rid of. And activation, that happens when you actually have um, the right environment for it to grow. Actually, that's technically germination. Um, the spore found the right environment and nutrition, and it started to grow. So the hyphae, or colonization stage, is, uh, you could also call it the fuzzy stage. The hyphae have grown across and down into the substrate and released, have released digestive enzymes to ingest the food source that they're interested in, in, hence the digestion of our collections. So this can be paper. This can be dust on the surface of an object any of those things, anything that's organic that the mole would be interested in eating. Sporulation. So out of these colonies of hyphae, more mold spores are formed, which are then ready to be released again into the air through the canidia. And, uh, and so the cycle goes again. So some um, information about spore characteristics. Dormant canidia and spores can survive extreme environments. 
and that can be freezing, dry, hot, etc. But not once the conidia has been activated and germinated. So once if the conidia are um, and the spores are dormant and haven't been activated, it's really tough to get rid of them. So that's when they're floating through the air after they've just been released from the conidia. So this is why removal of conidia is super important, because they can remain viable for over 20 years, waiting for the right environment to germinate. So that's why um, conservators and other professionals um, emphasize the removal of spores. So that's cleaning, especially. That's one of the key things. If you remove them from your environment, they will not have a chance to activate, germinate, and multiply. So that is key. OK, so we have some time for some fun videos. Um, so we can get to see mold in action. The first one, I'm not even going to try to pronounce. Um, I will just call it black bread mold. So the sequence that we have here will um, show the, um, the mold, the black bread mold, over a span of seven days. And the images were made at every 10 minute interval. So if Jenny would be, I'll set the video over, that'd be awesome. Sure, is this the strawberry? That's the strawberry. All right. Let me ask also, is there any audio with these? Nope. Uh, okay. Well, there's, there's a, there is, there's dramatic music. All right. Um, I have to disconnect <laughs> our audio in the room while this goes on. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry if I just ruined anyone's lunch there. Mm, yeah, it's not exactly pleasant to watch, but entertaining all the uh, nonetheless. So um, I just sort of wanted to show how quickly some of these circus molds can really go to town and uh, really devour. What the, I mean, these are live things that are devouring um, its food source. So um, the next one. It doesn't, isn't quite as um, voracious, but this is actually very entertaining. Um, so this is a white oyster mushroom that has been um, basically injected into um, this book here, which happens to have the illustrious Fabio on the cover. So I thought it only fun to watch <laughs> Fabio get ingested by a mushroom. OK, now we're live. Thank you. So in that particular instance, that, um, as it says here in the slide, that was a much longer sequence than the black bread mold. So that was a month and 24 days, nearly two months of um, growth. So that's not quite as uh, um, voracious as the other surface mold, but it just is just too much fun to not show because, uh, you know, Fabio gets eaten by a mushroom. So I had to show that. <laughs> 
also some other information about spores in Canidia, um, mainly sources. A lot of them come from airborne particles, and they range from size to 1 to 100 uh, micrometers, so they can be super, super tiny. In the world growth on plants, um, dust is where there is a lot of, um, where we get a lot of our spores and Canidia from. Uh, food, as you sort of saw in the last slides, um, sometimes on collection materials. And contaminated collections through manufacturing use of history. So here's a nice example of spores being released into the air. This is a giant puff ball. I think it is a technical name, believe it or not. Um, so you can sort of get an idea of how some of these can really release a large number of spores just at one time. And this slide here is a microscopic shot of an air quality sample that was taken. And this is how experts can tell about what kind of mold is actually in your air. And this is when, when they do air quality testing, this is part of what they're doing. So they can identify what is actually floating around in the air. So in this instance, you can see there's um, allergens like ragweed, um, nettle from, I think that's from, I don't remember correctly, from a tree. And the different types of mold spores, you can see that there are three different types there that they're showing. I'm going to talk a little bit about active versus inactive mold growth. So active mold growth, some characteristics um, I would use to describe an active mold growth situation would be squishy, spongy, or fluffy. Inactive mold characteristics would be dry, powdery, and dusty. And I want to emphasize that it is important to get rid of both kinds of mold growth. As both are a risk to your collections and to your health, and to the health of you, your staff, and your patrons. So some early indicators that you might have a mold problem or a mold problem coming. Um, so the presence of insects, especially book lice. Um, we have a book louse on your right there at extremely high magnification. These are very, very tiny insects. They are millimeters tiny. Um, but one of their biggest food sources, book lice, are microscopic molds. So if you have a large book lice problem, you also might have a mold problem as well. Uh, and of course, that telltale odor, that damp, musky, earthy smell that smells like a closed up basement. Incidentally, that smell you're smelling are volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, that the mold um, is releasing as it multiplies and grows. So some contributing factors that can make mold grow more quickly or spread more widely. Uh, Microenvironments exist that can support mold growth. Um, and these can be in environments that are controlled or not. Microenvironments exist um, that can support mold. The most common ones being behind shelves where air circulation isn't so great. Uh, basement floor storage in cardboard boxes, especially underneath the cardboard boxes. Damp microenvironments due to the location of water. And that can be near sinks, bathrooms, windowsills, any place where there's active leaking, that sort of thing. And any place where there's a post-water incident where drying did not take place immediately. That's a big one. So I mentioned the cardboard box issue in your basement. So here's a, an example of the cardboard box sort of incident, like I mentioned. Um, so you have some, um, I think most of what you're seeing here is tide lining, but this is sort of a tie lining being the really dark brown lines here that you see. But it's just to give you an example of um, some place you might want to check to make sure there isn't mold growth happening. This example here that I'm showing um, is with the data logger over to the right is sort of to demonstrate that you don't need the environment to be at 65% relative humidity or at a really high relative humidity is to have a mold outbreak. So um, what you're seeing here is there's an um, active mold there on that book, and but there, the relative humidity is 37%. So 
it may not just be the environment, but you definitely need to investigate what's going on here and to see why there is this mold outbreak. In this particular instance, this was because there was, there was mold in the air handling system. And this is another example of mold. This is on the paste down of some very large newspaper volumes. What had happened was there was um, a leak behind a cabinet. So the wood behind the cabinet was getting extremely wet, but it was also hidden by all of the large newspaper volumes. So it wasn't discovered till much, much later. And the longer it sat there, the more the mold grew. So this was a really heavy outbreak. So it's very hard to, uh, it's very hard to, it's very important to make sure that um, you check your collections if you can, um, especially during extreme weather conditions. This was during a particularly bad rainstorm and the building didn't have very good drainage and that's why it leaked behind these particular cabinets which were against the wall. And this is another example of um, a, a, smaller, a much smaller mold outbreak. Um, the window happened to be open near these books while they were at a facility being digitized. And so the mold grew very quickly onto the books in these particular areas. So we had them photo document it before they had the items cleaned. So how do you prevent mold? This is the number one thing that people really want to know. What is really important is the equilibrium moisture content of your objects. That means getting rid of excess moisture, reducing your relative humidity, and your dew point. The dew point being the moisture level in the air relative, well, not even relative to the um, temperature yet, but the moisture content in the air. Uh, you want to avoid storing your collections in damp places, such as your basement, um, any place that has a sink, any place that has active leaks. You want to keep your relative humidity as low well as you can. A good range is 40 to 50 percent. When you start getting above 65 percent relative humidity, that's when you start increasing the moisture levels in your organic objects. It's really important to make sure that you keep your relative humidity as controlled as possible. You want to ensure good air circulation around your collections. So I was talking about the microenvironments that can be a problem for mold, where you can have mold growth behind things because there isn't good air circulation. Um, so it's important to have things not butted up right against the wall. It's really important to have um, space between your shelving and your books so that things can actually circulate, air can circulate well. And make sure you respond quickly to water damage, like the example I showed with the bound newspapers that were in the cabinet where the water leaked behind the wall and no one knew it for quite some time. It's really important to make sure that you respond quickly so you don't give the mold the chance to grow. So materials that can hold more water than others are more susceptible. So things like paper, things, leather, textiles, Things that are more hydrophilic, meaning that things that really love water are going to be more susceptible to mold outbreak. When I mentioned equilibrium moisture content, that's talking about the moisture level in objects. And anything that really likes water and is, can readily absorb it is definitely um, going to be more at risk. So libraries and archives are the ones that really, really, really have to keep an eye out for mold. So another way to prevent mold is to regularly change your air filters in your air handlers and clean ductwork if you have a major outbreak. So I have an example for um, a library. A couple of slides back I showed you that mold outbreak that was next to the data logger where it was a dry relative humidity but there was definitely a mold outbreak happening. And I mentioned that it was because of the air handler. This particular library had a history of mold outbreaks. They had had, I believe, three in a span of, I want to say, five years or so. And in those, in that um, those time frames, they had cleaned the collection, but they had never taken the time to clean the ductwork. So when I actually went to inspect this particular mold outbreak, I saw that the mold was growing on the collections that were directly in front of the air supplies. I mean, you could actually 
almost dropped. It was a completely um, obvious schematic. You could see exactly where the air was blowing was exactly where the mold had landed. So um, with the help of environmental health and safety and some testing, um, we finally got the library to have the ductwork cleaned. And once that happened, they didn't have a mold outbreak ever again, with, and nothing else had changed in terms of the environment, in terms of air circulation, nothing like that. It was simply cleaning out the ductwork. So cleaning the ductwork is very, very important. Um, if you're not sure if you need to, you can have air quality testing done, and you can even do the inside of the um, surface of the air ducts if you need to. But I really can't uh, emphasize this enough. It's super important. Isolate and examine it, um, examining incoming collections. This is to this is helpful in preventing prevent, uh, potential mold infestations. Not only that, but also can be helpful with um, insects and rodents too. In, in case you're worried about those types of infestations as well. And regular housekeeping, something as simple as keeping your shelves and uh, surfaces free of dust actually is one of the best things you can do to prevent a mold outbreak. If you have a clean environment, those dormant mold spores will be removed, and they won't have that uh, opportunity to activate and germinate. So that's super important. Um, you can use disposable st static rags, like slippers, uh, that have no additives. Those things are really good to use in a collections environment, or, um, and or a HEPA filtered vacuum. HEPA filtered vacuums means that the mold will be kept inside the vacuum and not be spit out the back of the vacuum and back into the room. And this is the only type of vacuum that you should use to clean mold because you cannot afford to have the air sit back out through uh, the vacuum cleaner again because all of your hard work has just been spit back out the back of the vacuum and then you're creating the problem all over again. So infestation, uh, mold, mold will grow on everything and anything. It, it honestly will. If it has the right conditions and the right food sources, it's good to go. Um, depending on your mold that's have part of the outbreak, they like different conditions and different food sources. Um, they'll, it'll grow at almost any temperature, given there is enough moisture content in the materials for the dust that it's growing on. And it can grow in random patterns, or it can grow overall over the complete surface. Um, primarily, exterior surfaces are where you're going to have problems, like bindings and boxes and that sort of thing. But you also can find it on end papers, like the uh, example I showed you from the bound newspapers. And in the gutters of books, or on the edges of papers and boxes. Here's a really good example of that sort of random pattern that I mentioned. This is microscopy, and you can see that the mold is favoring particular, area, particular um, areas of the microfiche and not the overall surface. So it can be as random as something like this. Um, and here's another example of sort of a random selection. Um, this is mold that's growing on the spine of a pamphlet. Early pamphlet binders like these have a starch into adhesive, and mold really digs starch. So it grows right on there. But you can see it's not growing on some of the adjacent books nearby, because this particular mold is favoring the starch content of the adhesive in that pamphlet binder. So it can be as random as that based on the food source and the overall environment. So we have a couple others here, and uh, some other random examples. Um, they can grow on mold reels. Uh, they can grow on mold reels. I mean, they can grow on uh, microfilm reels, like you see at the bottom of your screen there. Uh, it can grow on paper. It can grow on the surface of particular uh, sound recordings. It really, it, it really is. Um, it doesn't have a particular favorite, so. So a little bit about the health hazards associated with mold. One thing I really want to emphasize, I know there's a lot of news coverage for things like Cephibotrys and things like that. But all mold will pose a health risk, and some people are more at risk than others. Most at risk to mold um, are those with compromised immune systems, 
people who have severe allergies to molds, obviously, or people who are allergic to mushrooms, people who are allergic to penicillin. These are all sort of indicators that these people are going to be, um, and also people who have respiratory issues like asthma and that sort of thing. Um, these are um, the kinds of people who really you should not have exposed to mold. And for people, mold is first a sensitizer, which then becomes an allergen, and then can later can become toxic. So, all, like I said, all mold can pose some sort of health risk. It really will be dependent upon the person. The mold itself doesn't need to be a quote-unquote toxic mold. If a person is sensitive or allergic to a mold, it can be a life-threatening situation for them. It doesn't have to be stachybotrys. It can be a form of aspergillus. It can be a form of penicillium. It can be a different type of mold. As I, oh, and here it is again. So as I mentioned, some molds are toxic to begin with. Um, but only testing is really going to tell in terms of if it is actually Stachybotrys or another type of toxin variant of mold. Um, Stachybotrys, black mold that everyone sort of goes on and on about, um, is uh, usually likes to grow on construction materials, especially drywall. It's not really so much, it's not really so fond of collections. The only way you're going to know for sure is what kind of mold you have, if it is an actually toxic, an actual toxic mold if you get them tested. Um, but for now, however, you can always assume that there will be a health hazard now or in the future. So treat them. You don't necessarily need to have it tested. It's just not a good idea to have any mold in your collection. So here's a nice picture of a bright pink wall with uh, Stachybotrys going on it. That's the big black spot there. So you can sort of see um, how it really likes drywall. And again, testing is the only surefire way to know if the mold is a toxic mold. And you have to test all of them. And if you remember back to the microscopic shot uh, slide I showed you of uh, the air quality test, there were at least three different types of mold spores. There's a lot to, there can be a lot to identify, especially in an air quality sample. So as I said, mold is everywhere. It's, you're, it's going to be in your air constantly. So there could be a lot of testing involved. So if you have mold, keep calm <laughs> and carry on. Um, so I just wanted to kind of like, for the, for the folks out there in the audience that are experiencing a mold outbreak, especially for the first time, um, I think keeping calm is really important. And I'm going to give you some practical step-by-step um, -step instructions on how to respond to it. I also will have some vendor recommendations. Um, that are part of these, that are handouts that you can contact who have uh, national offices who can help you, if, especially if you, if you have an extremely large mold outbreak. So in terms of response, here are the four steps you need to think about. You need to confine the outbreak. You do not need to have this spread further. And don't, I will be speaking about each one of these steps in more detail um, in slides that are coming up. Number two, stop the growth of the mold. Three, kill the active mold growth. And four, take steps to prevent reinfestation. And ideally, response and recovery will be done by a vendor and not by your in-house staff. And really, really important, do nothing unless you have personal protective equipment. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Because safety first, everyone. Um, Personal protective equipment, you also will hear the acronym PPE. Um, what that entails are gloves, masks, goggles, and protective clothing. Your gloves can be nitrile or latex for handling collection. Now, latex is for people who don't have, obviously don't have a latex allergy, but nitrile is more versatile in that respect. And those you can get from any sort of lab supply um, store. Masks, you can get full or half mask, half face half mask, half face respirators. They will require medical approval and fist testing. Or you can get N95 um, particulate respirators. They also look, look like masks. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Unvented goggles. You want to make sure that the goggles are sealed all the way around and don't have vents so that the mold can't get in and, and bother your eyes. 
uh, protective clothing. You can get Tyvek overalls with or without feet, or at a very minimum, uh, aprons or lab coats. So here you can see some folks uh, doing this kind of work in a uh, library setting. Um, not to jazz about the fact that the um, Tyvek sleeve doesn't um, go all the way down to his hands there. He would have been better off having sleeve guards. You can also get these Tyvek uh, sleeves to guards that you can put over your sleeves so that it will give you further protection. Because you really don't want any skin exposed. Uh, but he does have uh, an N95 respirator on. I'm also not jazzed about the glasses because they're not so goggles. But um, this is better than a lot of people sometimes who are doing this sort of thing. So. Here's a big one that I wanted to emphasize. Is it a dust mask or is it a respirator? Uh, number one, look at the labeling. It will tell you what kind of uh, mask it is. Now, a dust mask is something for very large particulate dust, like if you're working with sawdust or, um, I mean, sawdust is the only thing I can come up with at the top of my head, but something like that. Um, that's enough. We're talking, speaking about big particulate size. Now, if you're talking about molds, these are teeny, teeny little microscopic types of things that you're not going to be able to see readily with the, with the naked eye. So something like a dust mask isn't going to be very helpful in protecting you because it's not going to be able to filter out something that tiny. So you want to get something like the one on the right, which is an N95 particulate respirator. They'll call it an N95 particulate mask. They'll call it all sorts of names. But if you want, make sure it says that it's an N95. So um, it's usually printed right on the respirator, as you see in this example that I have on the right. Another good indicator, believe it or not, is the number of straps that are on it. If there's a double strap associated with it, oftentimes that's going to be a higher uh, particulate filtration level than it's going to be your standard dust mask like you see on the left. So I'm really concerned about people's respiratory health because once you get mold in your lungs, it never comes out. And especially if you work with it a lot, it becomes cumulative. And it can really have um, detrimental effects to your health. So I really, really, really want to emphasize the respiratory protection. OK, so now that you've got your personal protective equipment on, you're ready to confine the outbreak. Or at least, hopefully, the vendor is ready to confine the outbreak. Um, if you have a large incident, you want to isolate the area. Um, creating a negative pressure room to ensure that the mold does not spread to other areas. And this might include shutting down any air handling vents that may return air from that area. Um, the slide on this, this slide sort of shows an example of basically um, sealing off a contained area. In the middle there, that black line that you see there is actually a zipper that would allow staff to go in and out. Um, if you have a staff that does um, health and safety, they can test the air to make sure that the air that's surrounding the contained space has reduced the amount of mold um, spores in the air. They can do a test inside the containment area and a test outside, and then they can see the difference and they'll be able to tell you whether or not it's working well. For smaller incidences, if you have just a couple books that are a problem, you can you want to pack them to isolate them. You can wrap using Tyvek or spun polyester, which is kind of expensive. So I mean, if you use something as simple as a zip top plastic bag. But as long as the materials aren't wet, you don't want to do that, because that's just going to exacerbate the problem. And move the collections to a quarantine area and isolate them from the rest of the collections. And here's a picture of moldy things in a bag. So. It's just a regular Ziploc bag sealed up, so. OK, the other thing you want to do, step two, is stop the growth. So remember when I talked about moisture being key? Dehumidification in situ is basically one way you can stop the growth. Because if they don't have um, enough moisture to grow, they won't. They won't multiply. They won't germinate. They won't spread. You won't have the. Um, the high C stage happening. So dehumidification is super important. 
you don't have you can do it in situ. You do not have to remove collections if you have a really large, um, a really large outbreak. This is probably the best way to handle it. Dropping your temperature is not going to be sufficient in dehumidifying the air space. You really need to get industrial strength dehumidifiers to do that. Um, so as your air cools, and some people think about dropping temperature will help because mold like heat. But as you're dropping that air um, temperature, you're now creating air that can hold more, moist, more, more moisture. So the relative humidity goes up, and the materials absorb more water, which is a problem. So if this is a water incident that happens, um, as well as mold, air drying doesn't won't help with terms of stopping ink from bleeding and that sort of thing. So you're going to have some distortion of objects. And sorry, I saw some questions flying by on the left-hand side about um, sunlight. Sunlight doesn't kill mold. It's most likely the dehydration component that's happening. Basically, you're removing all the water. That's why it's killing the mold. Um, or it can be the ultraviolet or the UV radiation. Now, the thing about ultraviolet light is it does kill some mold, but not all of them. In fact, there are some strains of penicillium that can resist UV radiation due to um, the colorants or the, uh, the pigmentation that they put out. And there are some uh, mold species that are actually activated by ultraviolet light. So unless you know what you're dealing with, it's probably the best way to, to um, tackle the problem is dehumidifying, getting rid of the moisture. So here's an example of a big old dehumidifier. Um, and that will help with uh, drying out the space. And here's me in a space um, where I'm showing, I'm sort of showing basically that this is a space that um, has the, is an isolated space that also is having, has dehumidification going on. And I have my protective equipment on. I should have a hairnet on, actually, or something covering my hair. Um, and I'm Going, I'm cleaning uh, mold-infested artwork with a uh, HEPA-filtered vacuum on my back. And I look a bit like a space person, um, an astronaut. But you know, hey, all in the name of saving art. So I see someone on the left mentioned something about freezing. So stopping the growth and killing the mold. Freezing actually does work. Um, but it has to be the right temperature. The growth stops and the active mold is killed when you freeze because it forms ice crystals, causing the cells to burst. So I was talking about those cell walls that are really hard to penetrate. It's freezing causes ice crystals to form inside the cell and burst the cell. And so that's how mold is killed. Um, it buys freezing, also buys time for decision making and recovery preparation. You want to use caution when you're freezing uh, museum objects, especially composite objects, because if they're wet, they can become severely damaged when put into a freezer. And freezing and then air drying can reactivate mold, depending upon where you're doing your air drying. So, um, so yeah, so if you do the air drying, it's not going to help with coated papers. It's not going to help with bleeding ink. So it really depends on the collections that you're trying to save. Vacuum freeze drying um, is something that can be done by a vendor and who can also then clean the materials. And what vacuum freeze drying does um, is it takes, it freezes your object and then sublimates the water out. So it does a phase change by basically changing the pressure in the particular compartment so that the water can readily go from a frozen state to a gaseous state. So it never gets wet again. It's really cool. And it's really helpful because it means that the collection doesn't, the collections don't get as much in terms of the way there's distortion. Um, inks don't tend to bleed. And if you have coated paper, like in art books or magazines, the paper tends not to stick since the water is sublimated out of the collections, just like that. Um, it can desiccate collections, so use caution. Use caution depending upon what you're actually going to be putting into the freeze drying, the vacuum freeze dryer. Um, this is best for large outbreaks in libraries and archives. And I can show you sort of the inside of a vacuum freeze dry chamber. Uh, this is what it looks like. So it's changing the pressure. Sometimes you can apply heat as well, but you can actually opt out for the heat part of it and just work with the pressure changing. 
so that you can just sublimate out the, um, the water from the object. So just a quick note on fungicides. Generally, we don't recommend the use of them as conservators, uh, mostly because they can have a real problem on collections and people. So they really only should be used as a very, very last resort. And some chemicals will only stop the growth, not kill the mold, and those are fungicides. Ethylene oxide is a chemical that was used often to kill mold. But it actually can increase some material susceptibility to future outbreaks. So it really is something that we don't recommend. And it's even found in the uh, European Union at this point in terms of uh, safety. So just don't use it. Get rid of your ethylene oxide chambers. <laughs> OK, now how to prevent reinfestation? Clean the entire space not just collections, with a uh, HEPA-filtered vacuum, a uh, smoke sponge, I'll say what the, tell you what that is in a second, and if necessary, wipe down the shelving with a solution of no more than one cup bleach per one gallon of water, and then dry thoroughly after wiping it down. Replace any carpet, padding, furniture, wallboard that was moldy, repair or replace any equipment or plumbing that may have caused the problem, and begin an environmental monitoring program to make sure this doesn't happen again. And when I talk about cleaning the entire space, I also really want to emphasize the cleaning of the air ducts, as I mentioned in one of my previous slides. It's really important because that was the reason why we kept having the same mold outbreak over and over again, was because the mold was in the ductwork. So it's really important to do that as well. And I know I feel awful saying all of these things because all of these things cost money. So I'm sure you all have a lot of questions and concerns about that. So hopefully I'll be able to try and help you with those questions at the end of the lecture. This is a really scary picture. Um, and this is from Katrina, from one of my colleagues. If you can see, um, I'm going to try to get the green arrow to behave here. There's a pointer that sometimes works for me and sometimes doesn't. And right now, it doesn't want to. So if you look at the, you can see the mold on the wall. That's quite obvious. So if you look all the way down, follow the, your, follow the line down all the way down to the bottom. And you can see a distinctive line where the mold isn't growing below there. That is the water line basically creeped all the way up the wall. But that line down there meant that there must have been some really toxic things in the water because it was bad enough that the mold wasn't actually even growing there. So that's pretty yucky. So it probably is where the water line is, where that where that line of where there's no mold below probably stops. So above that, so you, the mold can go up really high. So you may think that the mold only, or the, that the water, that the wall has only gotten wet so far up, but the mold can grow up and beyond where the wall was actually wet. So you want to think about where the mold has grown. You want to think about the mold being above the water line on a wall. So if you're going to just replace your drywall, you want to probably go up further than you think. It may be in a case where you have to basically do the entire wall. It's because mold can grow even above where the water line was. So it was a very lengthy explanation to say, replace your drywall. <laughs> so for collection recovery, Always oh, assume that there is a health hazard in where your PPE is. Just don't even think about it. There's something you absolutely should do. You should always protect yourself if you're going into an area where there's mold. Uh, the inactive mold will need to be removed from collections to ensure that, it, that the collections are safe to use again, and also to prevent reinfestation. So mold does physical damage to collections, so any in-house cleaning should be done by trained staff wearing the protective equipment and knowledge of careful handling techniques for fragile materials. And I'm going to say this in I will, I'm going to say this in all capital letters. You should not clean your collections by yourself. Leave it for the professionals. It's super, super important, um, especially if you have a really seriously large outbreak. So only clean once the mold has been rendered inactive. So that means stabilize your environment. Remember I talked about active mold growth and inactive mold growth? 
So when you have active mold growth, you've got squishy, sticky kind of mold, which is really hard to remove. But once you have it rendered inactive, then you have a dusty, powdery sort of thing. So when you re um, basically stabilize the environment so it's dry enough that the mold has become inactive, it's much easier to remove um, in terms of a vacuum cleaner or a smoke sponge. I will tell you what that is in a moment. And um, it will be much easier to remove for you. Um, some things, when I talk about collection cleanup, I mean, if you're talking about one thing that's moldy, that's one thing. But if it's a really large outbreak, that's when we really want the professionals. And especially for things where it's really tricky, some of the other, um, like mold, mold stain removal, removal is tricky business. Leave it to the professionals. That's something that's really hard. Um, when you have mold outbreaks, and once the enzymes of the mold start digesting, like once digesting the object, it will often leave discoloration, their colorants, into the paper. Um, and those individual colored components, they often remain there. And when it secretes the pigments, those things are hard to get out. Um, I've, had, I've had people bring me things um, in my life as a paper conservator. And those are really, really difficult to get out without using some really um, tricky treatments in terms of chemicals, in terms of bathing the paper. Um, it's really tricky. So you definitely want to leave that to the professionals. Contact a professional paper conservator who will be able to help you with getting stain reduction if that's really important in terms of the mold out, um, in terms of mold staining. And consider replacement as a viable option for some materials. Not everything is necessarily something that's one of a kind, especially if it's um, like a circulating library. Oftentimes, you might be able to get a replacement copy, which might be cheaper than actually doing the uh, recovery. It really just depends on your situation. So here again are folks doing the doing some cleanup of, of moles from some collection items. They're wearing their protective clothing, very important. So cleaning collections, I mentioned earlier about the HEPA filtered vacuum. And once mold is inactive, it can be carefully cleaned off um, collection materials either using a soft brush to wash the mold into, um, into the nozzle, or it can be vacuumed through a screen if you're cleaning a textile. And it should be done in a fume hood in an isolated space with negative air pressure or last resort outside on a not windy, sunny day to reduce the risk of spreading the mold throughout the building. Wear your protective, clothes, uh, protective uh, personal equipment, please. So here's me cleaning some uh, moldy, I think that's a painting, yes. Yeah. It's a work of art and paper painting. But what I'm doing is I've got a half a filtered vacuum on my back. And I have a soft brush, and I'm brushing the inactive mold into the nozzle of the vacuum. And here's a smoke sponge. It's also called a gonzo sponge. It's also called, as you can see on the right, a lampshade cleaner. It's also called a pet hair picker upper. I think it has a variety of names. And this is a really great tool to use after you vacuum. What the smoke sponge is ultimately, it's vulcanized rubber. And it traps mold and dirt. And it's a really great thing because you can cut it in different shapes. So you can have it something to be really tiny if you need to clean a tiny area. Or um, you can use it in a variety of sizes. You want to make sure that you, um, if it's something that's really porous or something um, that, something like that, uh, you want to make sure that you don't drive the mold into the paper by using this. So you want to use a light touch when you're using this to clean. It's not something you need to sort of scrub, essentially. OK. So actually, that's the end of my presentation. So if you have any other additional questions, please feel free to contact me at my email address there. Don't forget the D in the middle, because apparently there was another Terry Kennedy that we're hanging around Yale at some point. But I'll be happy to answer your questions. Um, we have about a half hour left, so. Um. Yeah, Tara, I can start throwing some at you. OK. So this is while I catch them. The, <laughs> mil the million dollar question today, and we've gotten it from a couple people, is sure. what if you have no money for professionals? And of course, I guess it all depends on the circumstance. But if could you elaborate a little on what to do? Um. I mean, when we talk about all the steps that I've mentioned here, um, 
is I think you, it's important for an institution, if they have no money, to still follow these steps, um, isolation um, and that sort of thing. I think, it's depending, on, it's depending on your institution, I think it's really important to, I mean, I know we're recording this, so educating your board about how these sorts of things are a real health hazard and really how it's important to have professional status work might be one avenue I would take in terms of being able to do fundraising. I want to emphasize also that um, you can prioritize. If, it's, you can, if you need to do an item by item treatment thing, you can also do it that way. If it's an isolated incident with a couple items, if you follow the steps I've said and take safety precautions, you can probably do cleaning up on a small scale. It's the ones that have really, like their entire basement and blown up into mold. Those are the ones where I really, really wouldn't want the lay person doing the work only because it would be, it could really be adverse to their health more than anything else. Um, and their collections are important and they're important to a lot of people, but I feel very strongly about people's health more than anything else. Um, I think educating upper level administration is important to kind of get them to understand the health risks. I would probably start there rather than trying to have staff, um, staff I mean, not to be dramatic, but sacrifice their own health um, because people don't want to spend money. I think it's really important to kind of educate the people who have control of the money to get them to understand that you can't do this on your own. It really can make people sick. Um, I don't know if that's, I appreciate that's not the answer to the right here, <laughs> but I really, I, only because I, there's, People can get very, very sick from this. So it's definitely a yeah. great start. And Devin um, from Illinois says it's always an issue discussing it with the powers that be. So I guess the the answer is to keep trying. Um, I would actually there may be things that could um, hmm, let me think about this. Um, if they're not the priority, I mean, I'd be interested to know one what their priorities are. Um, because some of the priorities that they do have may, in fact, directly influence the, I mean, for example, if they're really jazzed about exhibits, for example, maybe some of the collections that are affected that they want to exhibit are covered in mold or at risk to be covered in mold. So if you can link back to some of the other priorities that they might have, you might actually be able to get them to at least listen. Um, I don't know. That's a great suggest suggestion. Um, let's. Um, we have another question from Sarah, who is curious if there are special considerations for mold on photographs. That is a good question. Um, mold on photographs. What the mold probably is try is ingesting there would be the gelatin sizing on the surface of the photograph. Um, you can still do the. Um, dehumidification, drying out the air, um, getting it to that inactive powdery state and doing the vacuuming. You just want to make sure you don't make it so dry that you end up cracking the emulsion in the photograph. Photographs, the collections can be super sensitive about um, relative humidity changes because they are, in fact, a composite object. They're paper and they're gelatin, which are going to react to your environment in different ways. So as long as you don't do it, like these are things I would not put in, if you could have access to vacuum freeze drying, you would not want to put photographs in there, for example. The pressure changes and things might actually do some major damage to them. But, um, so, and the smoke sponge, you don't want to use on photographs either because they're vulcanized rubber, which has sulfur, and sulfur can do damage to photographs. So you want to stick with your soft brush vacuuming um, for photographic material. And we have another question um, moving from a different object. Um, what's the best way to remove mold from leather? And we also have a question from Holly about removing mold from leather that's found on the covers of books. OK. Um, leather is, again, another hydrophilic material. So it's going to be susceptible to mold. Again, it's about dehumidification and rendering mold inactive and doing the same thing, doing the cleaning with the HEPA filtered vacuum. Um, you can also use the smoke sponges for those, since those are an acidic, already sulfur-containing material with the tannins in it. So you can actually use the smoke sponge for that as an additional way to clean. And we had a, uh, while we're on the subject of books, 
and the uh, covers of books. We have a question from Rebecca who's curious about foxing, and does that also need treatment? Foxing can come from a variety of um, sources. There's different types of foxing. You, they have different names. One of them is, uh, I mean, they're sort of, um, I don't even know what the word is. Um, some generic terms that we use, are, one's called bullseye foxing, and the other's called um, snowflake foxing. So if you have bullseye foxing, which basically what that means essentially is there's a very distinct dark center to your foxing. That's most likely uh, metal components that have been left in the paper during the paper making process. So the, and that have rusted over time due to high humidity. So those aren't really as much a problem. Um, actually, that's that's not a problem. It just makes it not, doesn't make the paper look very pretty. And the same with um, the snowflake foxing. That actually is due to mold in the paper substrate. It actually isn't something that is. It's not really going to be as serious. A uh, problem is surface mold going directly on the paper. It's just a, a defacing type of thing. So again, it's something that would need the treatment for, from a paper conservator to actually do sort of chemical treatments to lessen that effect. But it doesn't have any um, adverse health effects to anyone. It just it definitely doesn't make the paper look very nice. as part of the problem. So okay. And we had another question um, from Susan in Asheville who's curious, is mildew and mold the same thing, and is treatment the same? Yes. They're the same. Everything's the same. Mildew is just another name for mold. And then kind of a follow-up question from Angela um, in Kansas is, what's the best way to tell the difference between mold or wax or oil blooms and foxing on the surface? Ah, that's a good question. Well, one really good indicator is if it's not leather, it's not going to be um, spew. That's what the that's the term for the white the white waxy sometimes white whitish uh, waxy um, bloom that comes out of um, particular uh, leathers that have been treated over time with different waxes and oils. And again, that's also a sign of an adverse environment in, as well when it starts to exude from. Um, Leather. If it's spew, all you have to do is wipe it off with a clean cloth, and if it comes back, it's okay. It actually doesn't hurt your object any. Um, but if, so if it's mold, or if you, if you know the difference between mold and spew, um, it's, it's kind of based off feel, and I know no one wants to touch it. That's part of the problem. So it definitely has a consistency that's waxy, that's unlike mold, that's unlike active mold. Um, you can also use ultraviolet light. But you, if it fluoresces, if I'm remembering correctly, um, if it fluoresces, then it's usually mold. I think that's another indicator. But again, I think it, I'm not positive about that one. Um, it's usually based on touch, essentially, which I know nobody wants to do. <laughs> Make sure you wash your hands really well. OK. Um, we have a couple of questions about um, some of the equipment that you would use. Um, Laura in Delaware is curious, how frequently should you change your HEPA filter and your vacuum when it's used for mold removal? Oh, I, yeah. how often would you? HEPA filters are filters that are really, like they filter out a lot. So I would imagine you, if you have a very large mold outbreak, I probably would do it at the end of your session every time. Um, make sure you bag up everything that all the all the um, filters and things um, seal them up and throw them out outside. Like go to make sure they get removed from the building. Okay, and we have an, another question about a help HEPA filter vacuum from Barbara, who's curious if you should enclose the HEPA filtered vacuum bag in a Ziploc bag when you remove it. Yes, absolutely. Okay. OK, let's see. We've got a bunch of questions to get through. Um, <laughs> That's why we had the extra half hour. <laughs> yeah. So we have Paul in Connecticut um, who is curious uh, if there's a best way to deal with mold on wooden objects. Mold on wooden objects. We still, again, with the whole dehumidification and activity of the mold and vacuuming, still is applicable. Um, I guess I don't know. Is there a specific, do you have a specific question in terms of, I can't see the parking lot, so 
I don't know if I need to read it exactly, but no, it, there wasn't. It was just it was wood in general. Okay. Um, I, basically, the thing about mold removal is the general guidelines that I've given in terms of dehumidification, stabilizing your environment, rendering the mold inactive, and removal of the spores pretty much will apply in most situations. Um, it's going to, the only time that it might depend on the sensitivity of the object to changes in relative humidity, like I mentioned with the photographic material or composite objects. Wooden objects have a tendency to split and crack if your relative humidity gets too dry. But if you're keeping it with, at 40% RH, you're not going to have that problem. So that, that, those steps are really the key steps pretty much in mold removal for anything. OK. Uh, we have another question from Elizabeth who said, you mentioned the telltale odor, um, yes. and that the odor is always an indicator of mold, even when you can't see anything. So. Would you recommend accessioning something if it comes with that odor? Uh, um, I would do a very thorough check of it. Sometimes what happens is it may have been, like, there have been things where you kept them in an area that had mold actively growing. Like I said before, mold is kind of ubiquitous. And the VOCs that that item has picked up, which is an absorbent material, may have just picked up the sort of volatile components that are being given off, but not necessarily the mold spores themselves. So I would inspect the object thoroughly. Um, and if you can you know, vacuum it, do that. Um, if the smell itself is a problem, there are, if you go back, if you go to my, <laughs> I'm advertising for myself. If you go to my uh, Odors and Collections website, uh, webinar that's available here at the uh, Connecting to Collections site, um, I give you a hint of ways of getting rid of odors in collections that will reduce the odor for that. It won't at least smell like um, mold. Um, but it shouldn't be a risk to your collections, provided you inspect it thoroughly and they do some basic vacuuming and cleaning to make sure there isn't anything on the object. OK. And I hope Leah had a very similar question um, earlier about how you would approach a small collection with mild mold that you're considering acquiring. And can it be done without professionals? I think that kind of, it's a very similar question. It is. And as, like I said, I, I want to emphasize personal protection, number one, um, and making sure that you're in an isolated space if you are going to do the mold recovery yourself in terms of cleaning, because um, you don't want to spread it or expose people, other people to it. So um, I mean, a lot of the steps I mentioned in here can be done on a smaller scale. And I really, really want to emphasize people um, emphasize that people need to do that so that they don't spread it, put their coworkers at risk, the rest of their collections at risk, anything like that. So. Okay. Uh, our, we have another question from Lisa who's curious um, earlier. She asked, can inactive mold growth cause respiratory issues? Yes, absolutely. Um, because the thing about mold, even in an inactive State, it still can be a sensitizer or an allergen to someone who's highly sensitive to it. So what's most important is getting rid of those mold spores, whether they be active or inactive. OK. Let's see. So we did have a question when we were talking about air quality tests um, yeah. about the cost and who would you contact? Who does this? There are, there are a ton of companies that do this kind of work. Um, I would go to um, the OSHA website, which is, oh goodness, what does that stand for? Office of Safety and, whew, I don't remember what OSHA stands for, but if you do an OSHA search for OSHA, I bet you they would have um, recommended companies or sites where you could get someone to come in to do an air quality test. If you're at a university, they often have, um, the Office of Environmental Health and Safety can do that testing for you. Um, so, but I know there are a lot of laboratories um, around. Like, I even in the, I know in the state of Connecticut there are a ton of them. Uh, make sure that they have people who are basically registered to do this kind of work. Um, do checks through the Better Business Bureau, things like that, to make sure that you're getting a laboratory or um, someone who is a hygienist who knows what they're doing. Industrial hygienists make sure that they know what they're doing and they're doing a legitimate air quality test for you. 
Okay, and then um, another kind of question about whether we need a professional or not. Barbara in Montana says, do you need a professional to clean the duct work? Um, can you do the duct work with a HEPA filter vacuum? Is that sufficient? Um, actually, no. Uh, what you need to do is hire a professional company to do the duct cleaning, only because they actually do uh, a different process for cleaning duct work. What they do is they actually they seal off all of the um, supplies and returns in the ductwork and actually cut a hole or several holes, depending on how large your system is, in the actual duct line and apply um, humongous <laughs> HEPA filtered vacuums to that hole. And they might attach it also to one of the actual duct lines. I don't recall. The one instance I've seen it happen where they actually cut a hole in the duct line. And they seal the uh, vacuum tube to that, and then turn the vacuums on, and it sucks the living bejesus out of the, <laughs> out of the ductwork. So it cleans it cleans it very thoroughly. They go back in and clean, I think, by hand with different tools, and they also do um, they apply a uh, a fundus that on top of that. Okay. In the duct line, if you want them to do that, so I. Yes, it has to be done by a professional company. Okay, good to know. Um, I'm yeah. going to. So we're gonna. I have a bunch more questions to get through. So hang on if I haven't gotten to your question. Um, but I just want to pull over. We have a survey for this webinar. If you get a moment, please consider filling it out. It, it really helps us plan our future webinars. So I'll put that up. But let me keep plowing through these questions. Um, let's see. We have. Oh, God said. Thanks, Scott. Occupational Safety and Health Administration. That's what OSHA stands for. Thanks, mm -hmm. Scott. <laughs> so let's see. We have a question from Lynn in Kansas. She says, how about cleaning under a fume hood? If you're cleaning under the fume hood, does the hood need to be cleaned after you're done? Oh, that's a good question. Um, um, I would definitely clean the inside um, readily accessible area. Um, but I the thing about the air, that if you have a good fume hood, it should be sort of self-cleaning. I don't know whether there's actually, I actually don't know if there's um, filters or anything like that. I'm actually not certain how the fume, hood, fume hoods work. I know they work in terms of being able to protect you while you're cleaning the object, but I actually don't know um, how one would clean that. I've never had to do it, and I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe Scott knows. <laughs> Scott, post something if you know how to clean a few hood. <laughs> He's another conservator. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> Let's see. OK. So Sharon um, in South Carolina says her museum is planning a big move into a newer building in about a year. And she huh? is wondering if you know some of her things need to be cleaned. Do you have any recommendations on how to assess a move like that and how important it is to look for signs of mold? Oh, that's that's a very good idea. Um, it's very because you don't want to move the mold outbreak or mold with you. That's a very good point. Um, it might not be a bad idea to. I mean, depending. Did, did you say it was a museum? I'm sorry, I don't recall what you. Yes. Did you say it's a museum? Yes. Okay. Um, it might not be a bad idea. I mean, again, this is a money issue, but um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Having sort of, a, if you have a year out, you might actually have time to do a clean, like a mass cleaning of everything, either by a company or even the people in house. If you get the proper equipment, um, just in terms of dust and things like that, that might be a huge help in terms of making sure that you don't have any insect problems, mold problems, general dust. I mean, that's actually they have the time and can do that. That would be a really good idea. You can follow some sim similar steps in terms of cleaning. Um, if you have books and things like that, or things boxes, that's pretty easy to clean. Just using your HEPA filter vacuum with a brush attachment. Um, for other things, it might be a little more difficult, like textiles and things like that, um, because you need screens, you need large tables, um, depending upon what you're actually needing to clean. Um, but really just doing simple dusting would be a huge help, probably, in terms of that. But if you want to have a professional company come in and do it, there are conservators that do um, like conservation companies that will clean all collections too. That I know are, um, if you can get to an AIC um, directory, I know that there are companies that do that. 
Okay. If need be, I can post one. There's one in New York that we've used in the past. So. Okay. Oh, I sorry. Go ahead, sorry. Go ahead, oh, go ahead, uh, sorry. I was just going to, we have a couple questions about protective equipment. Um, mm -hmm. Our first one is, after use, do you need to get rid of all your stuff after you've used it once? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are respirators. If, there are, if you get a, a proper full face, half uh, face respirator through a company where you're changing cartridges, like those types of respirators, no. But I would throw out your N95, your gloves. Your co I mean, I would just throw it all away, bag it up, throw it away. No, I wouldn't reuse it. OK, let's see. Uh, we have another question about from Tracy in North Carolina who says when she is suited up and wearing the unvented goggles, uh, sweating is an issue. Do you have any recommendations? I guess she also is a, a, has glasses, and so there's an issue of fogging up. Oh, I know. Um, for sweating, um, I know with gloves, a really good trick is to wear cotton gloves underneath your nitrile gloves. That's a good trick for hands. Anything else, I would wear clothing that's cotton that's, or something that's readily absorbable, so that actually is, will help absorb some of the excess sweating. For glasses that fog up, I have glasses too. So it's, <laughs> I actually don't even know how I've, I've often taken breaks where I just step out and try to, try, try to um, clean them off for a time to do that, but I actually don't know. Okay. So we did have earlier on in the webinar, we had a lot of questions about sun and whether or not um, you could vacuum an object and then expose it to the sun if that would help it. I, I think that you answered it. I did. Um, but the answer is no. The sun mm -hmm. is not a viable source. Nope. It's just, it basically dehydrates the object. It's dehumidification in the sun. Okay. It's not the actual sunlight doing it. OK, let's see. I have a question um, from somebody in Mexico who says, does biologic dis biological disinfectants like those made of citrix, are those recommended to kill mold on books? And we also had a question kind of a follow-up if there's an alternative to bleach. OK. I would not, anything that's a biocide or anything like that, I would never use on an object directly, mostly because there's a lot of other components and a lot of those cleaning materials, those cleaning things that actually will cause more problems than help. What's really key, again, is deactivating the mold by reducing the moisture content and clean, for good surface cleaning. Is there alternatives besides bleach? Because I, I I, when I did this before, a lot of people asked about different types of cleaners that they could use. We usually recommend bleach because we know it will actually take care of the mold. Um, I don't know if other cleaners will. So I can't really say if anything else would be in terms of cleaning shelving and that sort of thing. Um, because it's, but the, the dilution of it shouldn't be a problem with fumes or anything like that if that's what the person's concerned about in terms of using bleach. So I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not afraid I don't have a real answer for that. Um, I just know that bleach is one of the things I know will like if you're going to clean a surface, like a shelf or something like that, that that would be your best bet. Um, I mean, I don't know whether, you know, a Lysol disinfectant cleaner or something that would be, or you, I think people have asked about vinegar, using other types of cleaners, and I don't really know. So I don't think I have a really good answer for that one, I'm afraid. OK. Um, I have a question about another uh, type of material. So. Got a question from Belize City. Um, we Ooh. have colonial bricks. How would you address mold spores on those? So brick. Ooh. Colonial bricks? Are, <laughs> are they sure it's mold? That's the one. That would be my first question. Only because mm. if I'm thinking about brick, I think about efflorescing. Um, a lot of times there are mineral deposits um, that can effloresce or kind of. Um, come out of brick. I've seen that in regular brick, but since I'm also not familiar with the material, I wouldn't even know. So that would be probably my first question if it isn't some sort of effluorescing and not mold. I would probably check that first. 
Okay. Because I'm not sure that that doesn't. Yeah, that's that's my that's my gut instinct for that. But I'm I'm not even sure what, <laughs> if it were mold, I wouldn't be certain how to clean that except the whole dehumidification vacuuming thing. I would still recommend that probably. Okay. Um, we have a question from Dee, so I hope you're still on, Dee. I know you'd asked if we'd gotten to it. She says, I was recently asked about a piano that has white powdery spots, but the owner says there's no musty odor. Um, she says she hasn't seen it only in photos. Do you think white powdery spots, is that likely to be mold? And if so, what do you recommend um, as a first step beyond isolation? A piano, so a big thing. <laughs> Uh, uh, where on the piano, on the actual, on the keys, on the black keys, on the white keys, on the piano itself, on the wood? Let's see. See, if I you want to type in where these spots are, you might be able to help. Yeah, I see she's, yeah, she's there, so, in Canada. Yeah. Because I'm wondering if it's something from, some sort of, ah, there we go. It's all over the wooden surface. I should mention I'm a conservator. Oh, hey. Hi. <laughs> uh, oh, my gosh. And you're asking me? <laughs> I'm a paper conservator. Um, oh, my goodness. Um, I, I'm wondering if it's, um, I wonder if there's some other issue with the wood itself. Oh, hey. It was in a museum. Oh, OK. It was in a museum in another city, so I've seen, only seen it in pictures. Oh, goodness. Um, yeah, because I would wonder if the environment in the museum is causing the problem. I would wonder about if the if there was a high humidity there and if that's what was causing the mold. Or that, that would be a hint to know if it actually was mold. Otherwise, I'm wondering if it's some sort of, I don't know, some sort of adverse effect from a cleaning product. It could be that, too. Oh, it looks like mold in the pics, but she says there's no odor, no, no odd environmental issues. Oh man, I have no idea. Oh, but Scott says that you should look at have them look at that website. <laughs> yeah, they have. The, the, yeah, Scott and his wife uh, have made this really cool website about different types of like, white stuff, <laughs> and they it's a lot from like le there's different types of spew mold that sort of thing. So like, is it mold? It's a good it's a good place to go. Yeah, you, yes, it's a oh it's it's a very good idea. Go go visit Scott's site. <laughs> <laughs> Scott's going to be teaching this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. So we had a question about putting books into plastic bags and whether or not that's going to make the mold grow faster. Um, uh, we had a question about putting something outside. Is that the best way to go if you're able to isolate something outside? I mean, you can, if, I suppose, if you're not worried about it being exposed to the elements. So I guess it depends on the object. And putting something in a bag is okay, provided the item isn't wet or damp, because basically, put it, they're right. If you put it in a bag, it's going to increase the mold activity if it has the right moisture content. So you want to make sure the thing's dry before you put it in a bag. OK. And then we had a question from Kim about how cold is cold enough to kill mold without damaging the host? OK. It's going to depend on your object, um, but it's got to be, I think it's minus, is it minus 20 Celsius? Oh, shoot. I don't remember the exact temperature. It's freezing and below. Like we're talking about, it has to be, and not something that's going to be your regular freezer. It has to be something like a chest freezer. I want to say it's, I'm getting my bugs and my mold mixed up. That's part of why I'm not remembering correctly. <laughs> because there are certain temperatures that will kill certain insects in that infest collections. And I'm, I mean, if you do, do minus 20 Celsius, you're good in terms of killing mold and insects and pretty much everything. Um, but yeah, for some composite objects, that might be a problem. But for things like paper and books, you should be fine. OK. And then kind of another question about freezing. Uh, Sonia uh, had, was curious when we were talking about air drying or doing the freeze drying process, how uh, can that possibly reactivate the mold if the mold cells burst in the freezing process? Oh, it can't. Okay. That's, the, that's the beauty of it. I think um, 
it's meaning that if there's some that, OK, this is a little confusing. I see what she's asking. Because the mold that, the mold that was activated, previously activated, and put into the freezer, that was for, then they will be killed in the freezer. The, and the air drying process, what, what we'd be concerned about is the mold that actually wasn't activated. I know this is a little, it's, it's splitting hairs a bit. So that there could be air drying problems. Air drying could be a problem if there happened to be mold spores on the object that were, in fact, not activated. Because taking them out of the freezer, because since they can survive the freezing process and all of that, they could be activated by air drying. That's what we're referring to, not the mold spores that were previously activated. It's very much splitting hairs, but good catch. Because it's important to differentiate the, the two. So, OK. Yeah. Uh, another question from Stacy in Nebraska. She's curious, is it safe to assume that if you see mold growing on a wall, um, on drywall, that there's also mold growing behind it? Yeah, probably. <laughs> That means that you've got a real, you've probably got a water issue behind that wall, especially if it's isolated. Oh, I see another conservator has put the temperature. Mold can still grow at minus 5 Celsius. OK. That's true. So they're going back to the temperature. I'm pretty sure it has to, I, mean, I know minus 20 Celsius will certainly kill it. So, um, so definitely. Um, Minus, yeah, we'll just leave with minus 20 for sure to absolutely kill mold if you're going to freeze it. So, yeah, I would inspect, and back to the wall issue, I would inspect to make sure there isn't some sort of moisture problem, like a leaking pipe or anything like that. OK. And uh, Beverly, you asked if we can post uh, some of these links that are being provided by participants. Yes, definitely. As soon as we post a recording of this webinar, we'll also include all these great links. So thank you, guys. Yeah, this evidence has been really helpful. Thank you so much because my memory is failing me. <laughs> <laughs> so we have just, I can get through a few more questions. I've kind of put some of the health questions on the back burner only since, only because it's not exactly the, the um, topic we're trying to cover. But um, OK, for all the other questions, we'll try. I'm going to try to get to them. So Erin, she has a question, and she says she probably already knows the answers. But what do you think about discarding moldy pages or cutting pieces of moldy papers off? Um, she thinks that the mold she's dealing with is inactive already, and they don't have a ton of money for professionals. Will removing those pages help at all, or is it not even worth it? Oh, um, if it's inactive mold, I mean, they could just do vacuuming if they, if they, if they really want to keep the object. They wouldn't have to necessarily resort to cutting things out. Um, because if, it's, if you're in a dry space, the object itself is dry, and you've got powdery mold, then you can vacuum. And that, and provide you keep it in an environment where it's not going to be reacted. Like it won't, um, mold won't grow on it again. You're not going to put it in a place with high humidity or anything like that. I, wouldn't, I don't think you need to resort to cutting pages out or anything like that. OK. Um, we had a question from one of our UK participants. Uh, she says, Tara refers to air circulation to decrease the risk of mold, but also the fact that mold does not need high relative humidity to develop. So what is the purpose of inducing air circulation? Of reducing air circulation? Of inducing, sorry. Oh, inducing. Um, the thing about mold is it really likes, it likes, I mean, in, in general, mold likes warm, damp, still, um, dark conditions, generally. It's one of, and the dark is key, also, because it's one of the few biologicals that doesn't need light, doesn't have a, doesn't use um, blank. Ah, my biology left. Um, ah, is it chlorophyll? Is that what I'm thinking of? There's certain plants that need light, basically, to to grow at all. And this is one type bio, a biological that doesn't need it. So um, it's just it's sort of everything is sort of compounded into one sort of thing. If you have the right components together, um, you'll get you can get mold. But it's also dependent upon the factors like what type of mold is it, what is it growing on, what does it want to grow on. There's always like so 
air circulation alone isn't going to prevent mold if you have all these other factors coming into it. It's one way that might help it from not happening, but it may not. I'm not really sure I'm answering this well. Um, is it written down on the parking lot? Can uh, I read it again? Let me see. If I can read it again, because I think I'm not. It might, I might have cut it. OK, that's cool. Sorry. And so she's photosynthesis. Yes, thank you. That, thank you, Anna. Oh, that's there it. it is. There it is. <laughs> Where is it? There, I made it big. Now I can't see it. The question is on in the parking lot? It is. I just made it a size 14, so it should be a little bigger. Oh, I have to move. The parking lot's all the way to the right on my screen, so can I move it? Let's see. No. So I mean, if you she, can did, move. she did have a follow-up in here. She was just curious, as um, wanting to know why you would use air circulation. OK. Essentially, air circulation is one component that will help. It's not going to totally get rid of mold or anything like that. So it, it's kind of one of the four factors that I mentioned that mold likes, in general, these four things. Air circulation will help as one of the components to prevent mold from happening, essentially, is what that means. If that okay. answers your question, maybe, hopefully. <laughs> so we, <laughs> are, we, we are out of time, Tara. Thank you so much. Oh, you're so welcome. So let's see. Our next webinar is Thursday, February 28th at 1 p.m. here in the meeting room. Uh, we'll be going over object handling with Mary Coughlin, who is a conservation professor at the George Washington University. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Again, um, if you have a chance, fill out our survey. It really helps us plan for the future uh, recording of this webinar. And all these great resources you guys have included will be in the community uh, shortly. So thank you again. Everyone have a fantastic afternoon. Thank you.